Welcome everyone to today's special half hour news briefing on the 2020 elections. I'm Sandy Close, Director of Ethnic Media Services. Today, our focus is on what happens if there's no clear winner on November 4th in the presidential race and in the other races. Our speaker is Dr. Nathaniel Persling, the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and one of the nation's leading authorities on the electoral process. We're honored to have him join us for the second time. Dr. Persley will present for the first half of today's briefing and then take Q&A for the remaining minutes of the briefing. Our interpreters today are Oscar Arteta, Kenneth Fong, and Jackie No, who will provide simultaneous interpreting in Spanish, Cantonese, and Korean. We will be sending out a video of today's call later this afternoon. Now, I'm eagerly turning the conference over to our moderator, Sunita Sarabji, and Professor Persley. Sunita. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, this election is extraordinary, not just because of the national race, but because of the um, extraordinary number of uh, people of color and women, uh, female candidates who are running in um, uh, uh, races down the ballot. So um, it will be a night of confusion. Uh, we expect confusion to abound. And here to add some perspective is uh, Dr. Nate Persley, who uh, Sandy has already introduced. Uh, Dr. Persley, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. I'm going to talk about both how to cover election day uh, and how to cover election night and the days after, um, and with a particular focus on how this election is different than other elections. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, actually, I think, uh, see what would be the best way to do this. All right. Um, can you see my screen okay? Let's see if I can do this. All right, well, it's probably in presentation mode. Let me, let me just stop that. Um, all right. Wait a second. I'll I'll just I'll share it just in presentation mode, um, um, but you'll be able to see it. So, um, the, let, let's start with with first principles here, which is what makes the twenty twenty election different. Um, the first is that the share of people who will be voting by mail will be twice what it was four years ago. Not everybody's gonna be voting by mail, but we expect between 150 and 160 million people to vote in this election. And we expect that um, roughly 70 to 80 million of them will be voting by mail. Um, 82, more than 82 million people have requested or are otherwise gonna be mailed absentee ballots. What also makes this election different is that those ballots will be uh, disproportionately from Democrats. And so there's never been before such a uh, bias in the uh, vote method that Democrats and Republicans have uh, been using. In addition, as you can see right now, there is record early voting. So easily 60% of the ballots that will be cast in this election will be cast before election day. Uh, it could be as high as 75% of ballots will be cast before election day. So while we, most of the uh, issues regarding reporting on this election focus on mail ballots, um, the, we also have to remember that people, you're still going to have, um, at least on election day, you're going to have 30 to 50 million people who will be um, voting by uh, in person in polling places. And those polling places will be different. 
Um, there are many polling places that have been taken out of commission because of the pandemic and they're no longer suitable. Um, we will have larger voting centers. Um, we will have long lines physically. That doesn't mean that, that, that there's congestion, but we know that if you space out voters by every six feet, that the line is going to be longer. Um, there will probably be fewer election day voters uh, so that in some ways there's less reason for the kind of dysfunction that we might see. Um, but um, everyone right now is quite thin skinned, right? That we're living in an incredibly polarized uh, political environment. People are looking for problems um, and, and they're likely to react in very um, dramatic ways, specifically if it comes to uh, issues of polling place violence or intimidation. All right. Um, let me talk about covering election day and then covering election night. Now these the two sides of the same coin. So look, there are going to be problems on election day. There always are. There will be some places with long lines. We're already seeing it in the early voting cent centers. There are going to be machines that break down. There are going to be examples of poll workers who got COVID and then don't show up, right? One of the things that we're very concerned about, right, is that, that the um, the traditional veteran poll workers are not um, volunteering this year because many of them are over the age of 60. The average poll worker in the United States is over 60. Uh, and so a whole group of novice and potentially less reliable poll workers will be taking their place. Uh, they will be inadequately, well, I don't wanna say they're inadequately trained. There will be some um, uh, jurisdictions where the training is going to be subpar because just like everybody else, you know, in this economy, they're doing all of this virtually. Uh, and so it's, it's uh, going to be very difficult to train poll workers to deal with the problems that they're going to see on election day, both with respect to COVID and just uh, in administering the election. And so we may see scuffles between voters, uh, issues when, when voters are asked to wear masks issues when voters refuse to wear masks and people in line are upset about that, as well as the, the issues that we've heard about um, concerning voter intimidation. The key question I think for reporters is not to focus on these isolated instances, but to see whether these are more systemic problems to a locality, right? Because like I said, just because there's one polling place with a long line doesn't mean that there's a systemic problem uh, throughout the system. Okay, now after the polls close, uh, and this is mainly what, what the, the topic today is about, uh, what should you do, what shouldn't you do? Do not focus on the percent of precincts reporting. This is something that the networks have often done. It's not clear it's ever been the right way to report results. It's almost certainly not the right way to report results in this environment, and here's why. Um, many states will actually have um, one absentee ballot precinct in a county, right? So that uh, it's not as if they, they count each one of the absentee ballots in the precinct and then report it as such. The, um, and so if you look at, you could have one precinct reporting, which would be the absentee ballot precinct in a county, and that could be half of the votes. Or you could have 90% uh, of the precincts reporting, and that'll give a misrepresentation of the results because the absentee ballots were not included in those precincts. And every state and locality is different in this way. Um, do they report results, uh, absentee ballots at the precinct level or at the county level? And so just get rid of the notion of precincts reporting. Um, similarly, you do not want to report decontextualized results. And what I mean by that is that you have to look at results um, uh, given what we know about the absentee voter pool uh, and the like. And so if, you know, the, the fact that different, you have uh, some votes that are coming in for President Trump or, or for Vice President Biden, for example, or even in the local races, does not, uh, th th those initial results are not necessarily predictive of the final results. And also, I think it's important that the media, even though they will project winners, there's nothing we can do to stop that, to not declare who, won has, who has won a state because election results on election night or even in the week after are always unofficial, that uh, we should send the signal that what makes an election official is certification by the chief election officer in a state. All right, so what, if you can't do those things, what should you be doing? The first is, 
and this is hard to do, but, it, but, but if you prepare, you can do it. Um, to when talking about the votes that have come in, re relate that to the total number of votes that are expected. So as I said before, precincts reporting is not, is not terribly informative. But if you know that there are going to be a million votes in a jurisdiction and half a million votes have been counted, then you can say half the votes are taken in, right? Now that requires that you know something about the likely total number of votes in a particular jurisdiction. The, the local authorities will know some of that as well as some modeling that, uh, if, for example, if you look at a group called Citizens Data, uh, they've, been, they've been modeling this. Second, absolutely critical um, to report where the votes are coming from, both geographically and by mode. As I said before, knowing whether the absentee ballots have been counted in that first batch is quite important. Uh, and then where geographically in a state, the results are coming from. And then I, the most important piece of information that you can give in order not to mislead voters is to report the results in 2020 as compared to 2016 in areas that have fully reported. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we are going to have a lot of information on election night, right? And, and we are living in a very impatient society and everyone's gonna to try to mine those nuggets of information for insights. But um, the, the key insight will be how is President Trump doing it for the presidential election? How is President Trump doing as compared to 2016? Okay, and you will be able to get that sense from states which have nearly fully reported on election night, that will include Florida, by the way, or counties in any given state which have uh, uh, nearly fully reported. And then to see what President Trump's percentage is as compared to 2016. And then, then one can see whether there's been a kind of rising tide either for the Republicans or the Democrats. All right. You've heard of the caricature of, of uh, 2020 election, which what we call the red mirage and the blue wave, right? And the idea is that there's going to be a red, that, that because the election day vote will be more Republican than Democrat, that then Donald Trump will have a, an advantage in the election uh, day vote, which will cause a red mirage, that then will be followed by um, highly democratic uh, absentee votes. Now that may happen, but you actually may get a blue mirage at some point also, because there are states like Florida, where at 7.30 on election night, they will report the, uh, all of the mail votes that have been received at that point. So it's important for you to understand which states count votes when. So Arizona and Florida will have um, counted votes in the weeks prior to the election. Places like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and, and Wisconsin will only be uh, counting the ballots on election day or the day or shortly before. And so um, there's, there's real risk that if we, um, if we are in a close election scenario, and, and that would mean something like the 2016 election, that we're going to have to wait uh, for election results. And so I think now it's quite important for you all to prepare for how you're gonna deal with unwarranted claims of victory by one of the candidates, right? How to deal with foreign and domestic uh, disinformation regarding things like destroyed votes or fraud or election official malfeasance in the vote counting process. Um, it's important to, to amplify the voices of authoritative sources when it comes to the vote counting process. We have tried to do this um, at the Healthy Elections Project. You can see the specific work that we've done by with videos of election officials that you can find at healthypolls.stanford.edu. Um, but manage voter expectations as to when uh, results will be available. Um, it is too early to tell, even now and, and, and certainly uh, you know, in the day after the election, what might be the issues that, for example, would lead to litigation. Um, but but it, it's important to, uh, as I said, amplify the voices of the responsible folks and then to make sure that um, um, you can focus on what might be the uh, points of legal contention going forward. That's something I'm happy to, to talk about. You can get more uh, information on this at our website, healthyelections.org, um, where you can see we have reports on each state, on mail voting and research on everything from the uh, current litigation to uh, everything that will be happening on election day and before. 
And with that, I'll uh, turn to your questions. Um, should I read them or, or do you want someone else to read them? No, um, I, I will uh, okay. ask each uh, reporter to ask their uh, question. Um, I would like to start off with a couple of questions for you, Dr. Bursley. Um, so given um, the uh, new Supreme Court, do you believe that uh, our presidential election will be decided by the Supreme Court? Well, the, the question about whether the, the election will end up at the Supreme Court, it depends on how close the election is. So um, it really just depends on whether it's close and whether there are legitimate legal issues. So look, if it's a close election and it's a replay of the 2000 presidential election where it comes down to 500 votes in one of the states, yes, I would expect the US Supreme Court to be quite involved. But you know that is a very rare event. Even in 2016, which was a close election, we didn't end up having it go to the Supreme Court. Absolutely. And how um, uh, can you find out which states are going to be counting ballots um, prior to election day? Yes, the, the, the New York Times today actually has a, um, a graphic on precisely that. And then we will publish uh, today uh, a large spreadsheet uh, with that information as well. Uh, as we're talking, I'll find the, um, the New York Times uh, thing and I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Absolutely. Um, Henrietta Burroughs has a question for you. Henrietta? Yes, thanks, Anita. There are lots of predictions about the final result. Uh, how close do you think these predictions are, will be to the final outcome? And what effect do you think these predictions are having on the actual voting? Well, that's a good, the second part I think is, is a really interesting uh, question. Um, and let me say two things. Uh, I have no special insight as to whether the polls are, are uniquely accurate or inaccurate this year. I can only say that they, the, a lot of these polling firms learned lessons from 2016 about how to do the voter modeling. I tend to think the election is much closer than people assume, but that's because I am a, a, um, a nervous person. Uh, and so I just tend to think that that uh, the idea that it could be an easy blowout election that that goes against my personality, but that just depends on who you are. The second point though is a very interesting one. And I commend to you an article by several authors, one of whom is Solomon Messing, who makes the argument that the predictions of a Hillary Clinton, uh, of over, overwhelming Hillary Clinton victory in 2016 led some Democrats not to show up to vote. And so I think that is an important question to keep in mind, whether the existing predictions of Biden winning handily might have an adverse effect. Now, we are going to see an increase in voter turnout. We already know that. Um, and you know there were roughly 135 million people who voted in the last election. There will be at least 15 million more people who uh, turn out in this election. Um, the question is, it could be 20. And uh, so it doesn't seem like people are, are being prevented from going to the polls, but we don't know who's going to the polls. Although everybody's pointing to the absentee ballot requests and early voting as it's favoring Democrats, I would caution you against making predictions over the likely voter pool based off of the early and absentee voting. Thank you. Jaya Padmanabhan has a question um, and she would like me to ask it. Um, how soon will we get an ethnic breakdown on the votes, if at all? Well, so we'll get um, exit poll data on election night, but that's notoriously inaccurate. <laughs> uh, and so you'll get a good sense though in the 24 hours after the election from Edison Research who, you know, who, who voted. Um, and what the share was. Um, some of that then gets corrected in the days afterwards um, and, and months afterwards, but, but you'll get some sense of how different racial minorities have voted in the day after. Absolutely, Sandy has a question. Would like to know to, uh, how much worse is, this is a, a big general question, but voter suppression. Are we looking at 2020 as a year when voter suppression is going to have a bigger impact than previous 
elections or have we sort of met that demon and flattened it? Well, it depends on what you mean by voter suppression. Now, and I know this is and I, this is not a dodge, but it's it's a sort of plea for clarity, also in the way that media talks about voter suppression. So, there are certain things like um, the way that Florida has dealt with felon reenfranchisement that you know you that, that you know Florida voters tried to by law reenfranchise all former felons, and now the, um, the basically through decree in Florida, um, many of those felons are not going to be allowed to vote because they are saying that if they haven't paid their money that they owe for court, you know, for different costs, that then they're not able to vote. So that's an example. And, you know, you look at just the opinions in dealing with ballot drop boxes in Texas or witness signatures in South Carolina, there are rules in place right now that are restrictive for voting. Um, and, and you heard yesterday about the Supreme Court's decision in Wisconsin, over the Wisconsin case, which will uh, not allow for ballots that were um, cast or that were that were received after the deadline in Wisconsin to be counted. So though that's a description of the landscape. There is plenty of examples of where ballots are not going to be counted, even though the voters intended them to. Um, then there's there's the question of polling place practices and suppression in that regard. And you know, while there's certainly obviously we have a rich history in the United States of voter suppression, particularly in Jim Crow South and the like, voter intimidation, even people being killed for trying to vote. Um, the, the, it remains to be seen whether we will have some kind of unique um, system of voter intimidation in this election that we have not seen in recent elections on any grand scale. Obviously, there, the president and the president's son have talked about recruiting an army of election observers. We don't know what that means. Um, and whether those folks will simply be observing the process or whether they'll be challenging the status of voters uh, and so we'll, we'll need to see. Uh, but remember, again, election day is one is going to be one fourth or so of the vote. A lot of this, um, the kind of so-called vote suppression might be uh, might happen in the ballot counting process as well. And we need to be vigilant in keeping watch to make sure all the ballots that were cast early end up being counted. Uh, Fernando Torres asked an important question, which is, have you talked about this with mainstream media? Because mainstream media might be doing one thing and ethnic media might be doing another uh, based on uh, your comments here. Oh, well, yeah, I'm the NBC News election analyst. So, you know, and PBS NewsHour. So that's pretty mainstream. <laughs> so yeah, I'm talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Shristi has a question for you. Shristi Prabha of India Currents. Hi, thank you so much for um, all the information, Nathaniel. I had a question about the impact of the narrative that the USPS will potentially be slow or might try to rig the election results. And so just what is the impact um, of mail-in ballots or mailers trying to mail their ballots since there is such an influx this year? Good question. So the um, we don't know how many mail ballots will arrive late. Um, we know it will be in the tens of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands. Um, that is not, that would not be unique to this election. Um, I, my guess is actually the pace of mail balloting and the, the actual, the time it will take for a voter once who mails a ballot for then the election jurisdiction to receive it will be the same this year as it was in 2016. Now that is only that, that you can take that as, a, as good news or bad news, but that's because no one was reporting on the hundreds of thousands of mail ballots that didn't make it there on time in 2016. And so um, in 2020, we're gonna have twice as many mail ballots. And so it's possible we, should have, we could have twice as many uh, ballots that are late. On the other hand, the campaigns are trying to mobilize their supporters and their voters to make sure that the ballots get there, you know, are mailed earlier. Um, but, but what I'll just say is that the, you know, when you talk to the local postal officials, they feel that they've got this under control. And by control, meaning that the, if you mail it a week before the election, that it will be received in time for the election. Now, right now we're, you know, we're beyond that, that period or, or today is the week before the election. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, voters who haven't mailed their ballot yet should deliver it in person um, instead of putting it in, in the postal service. And one thing you should know and the reporters should know is that roughly half of absentee ballots are not uh, put into the postal service. They're either delivered to uh, by hand to election offices or polling places, or they're put in these kind of special ballot drop boxes. So when we call it, we call this vote by mail, but it doesn't mean, it means that the voter probably received the vote by mail. It doesn't necessarily mean they return it uh, through the postal service. Arcelli Martinez has a question for you, Dr. Bruceli. Arcelli. I'll ask the question for Araceli. How do you predict the Latino vote this time? Can we expect a massive assistance to the polls due to the aggressive immigration policies that Trump has put into place? Um, I, I don't, I, so from what I see in the data, I don't see a, a either a large uptick in Latino participation or a uh, significantly altered composition of support. Um, like it doesn't seem, for example, that there's going to be, you know, massive shifts in Latino voting patterns. Um, um, but we'll, we'll see. And of course, it depends on which area of the country we're talking in. We're talking about Cuban Americans in Florida. You're talking about Puerto Ricans and Americans in Puerto Ricans in Florida, uh, like in the Orlando area. You're talking about Mexican Americans in Texas. Right. I mean, you should expect Donald Trump to get about a quarter of the of the uh, Latino vote. It just depends on where um, and maybe more. Maybe he'll get more than that. Cherie Cuero Moreno, and I'm sorry, Cherie, for mispronouncing your name, but um, has a really important question for you, Dr. Bruce Lee. Cherie. Okay, I'll ask the question for Sheree. Do we know what country outside the US most mail-in ballots will come from? I think that's a really important uh, question. It's a very good question. And I'm tempted, I, I, I'm gonna assume it's Canada, but I don't know. And it, it really just, and that's just because you have to know where, where are there more Americans abroad than other countries. And so I'm assuming that that maybe it'd be Canada, but I, I really, the, the, the place to look is the US Vote Foundation. I'm sure they have that, that data on their website. And we have another question from Sandy. You, yeah. when we talk about this as an historic election, going beyond who actually wins, having a record turnout, how do you think that will impact future elections? Well, so I think the, the, the turnout will be, the number of people voting might be, um, you know, certainly higher than 2016. I don't know whether as a share of the eligible voter population, whether we're going to exceed say the 2008 Obama election. I think it's too soon, too soon to tell um, um, because there are more people now. So we don't know what the percentages are going to be. I think that this election is going to fundamentally change our election infrastructure in a lot of ways. I think that the um, move to mail balloting is not one that's gonna easily be reversed. Now that um, voters have become accustomed to voting in such a convenient way, there are going to be a lot of states that now they've purchased the equipment and trained their, their folks that they're going to say, all right, we're gonna keep these uh, rules in place. So I think that's, that's sort of a major uh, shift. Um, you know, the, 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 um, the principal effect of this election will be who wins, <laughs> you know, whether Donald Trump wins or whether Joe Biden wins and then who wins the Senate. Uh, and based on those results, you could see major reforms of the democratic process, just as you could see major reforms of the courts and other institutions. And so I think that this election has been instructive in kind of paving the way for certain types of democratic reforms, reforms in the next Congress. Um, Dr. Persley, can you stay for three more yeah. questions? Yeah. Um, so Fernando Torres has a follow-up question. Fernando. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we all know that there is a, a monopoly of information in this country. We all know that a few news outlets set up the 
news agenda for this country every day. So it's not going to be different when AP, Reuters, uh, CNN, ABC control the information and probably, as always they as they do always, will announce the winner of the election. And probably it's going to be early, too early to be true. And I wonder if you have something to say about that. So I think the Associated Press and Reuters are actually the most important actors in the of the description you just gave because the AP sees its role as declaring winners. And you'll remember one of the things I said earlier on in the in the presentation is that I, I really think it's a mistake for any of these wire services to declare who is the winner. You can make projections, you can say, you can look at the, you know, where things are going. Um, based on the fully reported data. But I think to say to, that's not the, the role of the Associated Press until the election officials actually have counted all the votes. So, so that's, that's my general view. And I, I have an article in, the, in Slate on this that the AP has not been thrilled with me about. Um, having said all that, what, I mean, you, you're right that, there's, that, that they play an outsized role, but the decision desks at each one of the networks also plays a really important role. Now they rely on the Associated Press to a large extent because we don't have a kind of national election authority in this country that will um, oversee the dissemination of results. Um, but the, the, the network decision desks, and let's say there are about seven of them, right, are independent from each other. Not only are they independent from each other, they're actually independent from the news and opinion operations. So you might think that Fox News, Fox News decision desk would be in line with the editorial stance of Fox. But I can tell you the decision desk at Fox is a very independent organization, very different um, than, than the folks who will be talking about the results. Um, and so I think that's important. And also, I, you know, one group you you didn't mention is Facebook or um, Google. And so, you know, I think Facebook plays a very important role. And I and I've spoken to them quite a bit about their voting information center. What they are going to do is to have a dashboard on election day and election night. They will be relying heavily on Reuters, but they will be putting up the calls from each one of the networks on their on their sites to try to to mainly to try to get after uh, and combat disinformation that might be coming from official or unofficial sources. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you one question as a final question. Um, uh, Chuck Todd asked this of Corey Lan Lewandowski on uh, uh, Meet the Press uh, on Sunday. What state will you be watching on election night that um, uh, for you will determine uh, this race? So, so it depends what time we're talking about. So this is what's <laughs> important. So, so it's important in the, the, the Pennsylvania remains the tipping point state. It's the most important in a lot of ways. However, we are going to have a lot of information before Pennsylvania reports its results. And so the first state that I'm looking at is Florida. Right. And, and so if it, because if Joe Biden wins Florida and we will know most of the results by midnight in Florida, then then that game is over. Similarly, places like Maine and New Hampshire for President Trump, if he wins those, I think he wins the election. And so the, the, there, there are places on uh, in the in before midnight on election night, which will be very revelatory. Right. Very descriptive of where the election is going. That is Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, Ohio, um, will all give us a good glimpse as to whether, you know, what world we live in. This is the, when I talk to reporters, this is the way I like to position it, which is by midnight on election night, we will know what world we live in. Do we live in a, in a world which is going to come down to absentee ballots in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, or do we live in a world where there's a clear victor? Right now, that doesn't mean the candidate that loses is going to concede early, but we will know based on the results that have come in, right, which will be over 90 million votes, right, which will have come in by the end of election night or by the next morning, um, which world we live in, whether it's one that's going to be a, 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 a battle that will lead into extra innings, right, lead into overtime, or whether it's one where we can reliably predict who the, who the winner is. Thank you.
Sandy, do you have any final questions? Or can, can I, before Sandy jumps in, let me, because Henrietta just asked a, a question here. Oh, sure. Uh, and I want to make sure that, that I respond to that so that that's not, um, so I'm not misunderstood. The, the point that I, that I was trying to make is that there are going to be some states where you will have nearly complete results, okay? And so those states are the ones to pay attention to. And that, those are the ones that I was listing before. When, if you look at the, at the, the, the states where you're only going to have 50% of the votes counted, then you're right. That would not be predictive of the results. It's important to uh, look at the states and the counties where you have nearly fully reported results, compare them to 2016, and then you can make predictions about who's likely to win. Fantastic. No, just a tremendous thanks for your time and expertise. You're remarkably easy to understand, and it's just uh, it's just a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Persley.